Veterans Museum. We're very glad you could join us today uh, for our exciting morning of music and performances and dramatization. Um, our show now is the Letters of the Passion Family uh, from Wisconsin. And um, we have the letters up in our archives. Our archives close on Saturdays, but if you ever are doing Civil War research, see what we have up there, do come and visit us. We have letters, photographs, maps, journals, diaries, you name it, we have it up there from Civil War to the present day, as well as our oral history uh, collection where we have veterans interview other veterans and we record them and are currently in the process of transcribing them so that we can get them online as well. So the letters that you're going to hear about here are uh, the letters between husband and his wife and son, and I think they're great because a lot of the emotions are the same as emotions that we feel today when we're writing back and forth to the book, when one writes to anyone, when they're texting each other, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but we uh, found these letters and we talked with John Sable, who's a playwright here in Madison, and he wove them together into a very wonderful, dramatic reading. So. General Douglas MacArthur once said, old soldiers don't die, they just fade away. That sentence certainly befits Wisconsin Civil War soldiers. Most have faded into time. Their lives forgotten were never chronicled by historians. As soldiers, their names do appear on muster logs and service records, but they were more than names and dates. They were people, real people, not all that different from you and me. They worked, they played, they loved, they celebrated, and they suffered. They also did something which must have seemed so ordinary, yet unintentionally became something quite extraordinary. They wrote letters to friends and family back in the surviving letters, we glimpse into the lives of soldiers and their families who would otherwise be washed away with the sands of time like so many tears in a thunderstorm. Far from pristine, often worn, faded, torn, filled with misspellings and undecipherable handwriting, these letters serve as a fractured, clouded looking glass reflecting a past long gone, yet are still able to paint a very personal picture of Wisconsinites involved in the Civil War. But if you listen carefully, the stories told in these letters don't always stay in the past. Sometimes they reach out and connect with us today, as in this excerpt from a letter to James Patchen from his cousin Clarence Burnett, May 1st, 1862. Cousin James, I received your letter in due season, but have not had time to answer it, and could not now, only it rains so hard that we can't work in the field. We have got our wheat in more than a week ago, but have not got the oats in yet. We intended to commence today if it had not rained. 
I have been dragging another man two days. It come pretty hard for me for the first day or so. It is the first farming I have ever done. And I am not particular if it should be my last. It made my side ache to walk. That is the greatest trouble I have about farming. I am subject to the side ache every time I walk any distance. I have had the pleasure of seeing some secesh prisoners and a worse looking set I never saw not accepting the fresh Norwegians that came over last spring. Mary can tell you how they looked. There was about 300 of these prisoners, and they were taken at island number 10, and were in the hospital at the time, sick. There was about 60 that were not able to walk. They had every kind of disease you could think of, I guess. They stopped in Mazomani, a town three miles from here towards the prairie to get their dinner, and the whole town turned out to see them. So I guess that there will be some sick there before long. The prisoners are at Madison now. There is about a thousand there now. There was about three carloads of the wounded soldiers from the 104th, 16th, and 18th regiments went through here today. Those that were able to be up felt happy as clams because they were going home, I suppose. It looked rather hard, though, to see so many with their heads, hands, arms, and everything else done up. Some were laying down on the seats with pillows under their heads and sides, just where they hurt. The cannon that was taken by the 14th that they sent to Madison went through here yesterday. It had seen some hard times. A cannonball had taken a hunk out of one of the tires and broke one spoke, and there was about a half dozen musket holes in the spokes and carriage. Well, I must stop. Give my love to all, to the girls, especially. Your things. I remain your cousin, Clarence Burnett. And first, this seems like an unremarkable look at a rainy day 150 years ago. But those soldiers you referred to, they did come to Madison. They were housed at Camp Randall. Long before the university made a football stadium, Camp Randall was a prisoner of war camp and a training camp. Many of these prisoners were very ill, and a lot of them, 139, died of their sickness. They're buried at Forest Hill Cemetery across the street from West High School. It's the furthest north any Confederate soldier is buried. Even if you haven't been to Forest Hill Cemetery and seen the Confederate rest there, that beat up old cannon that Clarence mentions, captured by the 14th of Wisconsin, is something everyone in this room has seen. It sits about 50 feet away at the entrance of this room. Until this very moment, you probably hadn't realized that a century and a half ago, a man who didn't care much for farming, watched that very same cannon parade down the street. His eyes wet with pride and a little sadness as he watched the wounded Union soldiers returning home. He gazed intently on that cannon, noticing the broken wheel and the musket holes in the spokes. A not history book would have chronicled that moment nor the Confederate prisoners who stopped at Mazomania a few days earlier to have dinner, nor the townspeople who came out to gawk at them. This is a providence of these small, brittle pieces of paper. Letters sent from one person to another, never intended to be a record of history, much less read aloud in front of a group of strangers generations later. Yet, here we are today. This is the Wisconsin Letters Project. Today we present the letters of the Patchen family. Augustus Patchen, his wife Margaret Patchen, and their son James Patchen. Augustus Patchen answered President Lincoln's call for volunteers and enlisted as a private. He's assigned to the 10th Wisconsin Infantry Regiment, and after a year of service, he's ready to come home. 
but his work ethic and charisma earned him a quick promotion to sergeant. The pay increase is substantial. <clears throat> Camp near New Market, Kentucky, October 27, 1862. Dear family, I received your letter on Saturday and was glad to hear that you was well. I am well today. We were paid yesterday, although it was Sunday. We have no Sunday in the Army. I received $59.80 for three months, and there are two months due. I do not know yet how I shall send it to you, but I think it shall be by express. I will send $45. I do not know where Jones is. Some of our company is in Louisville Hospital. I heard yesterday that Bull was dead, and I expect that it is so. He was a good boy, done his duty well. His wound was doing well, but then some fever set in, which caused his death. Now it is folly for folks to send things to sick and wounded soldiers, for it hardly ever reaches them, unless someone is going straight through. We got our knapsacks today. Uh, thing, my things was all right, but some of the boys lost theirs. Snow fell here, about four inches deep Saturday night, and it was quite cold. But it's pleasant today, but our blankets were very acceptable last night. I expect we shall put up our tents this afternoon unless we get orders to leave here soon, and we may, we may not. War is a curious business at best. I shall get out of it as soon as I can, for I want to be home with my family, and will be as soon as I can. I will write more when I send the money. James, you can tell Mrs. Bush that I've not seen or heard from him since the 8th of September. No more at present. From your affectionate husband and father, A.D. Patchen. The Patchen family sent frequent letters to Augustus. In the spring of 1863, James is excited to share technological and pricing news with his father. Lysena. April 5th, 1863. Dear Father, we are all well today. It is quite warm today. It is so poor weather along lately that we have not been able to plow any yet, but we have got five acres dragged over, ready to sow, and I have got to go and take Mary up to Portage in the morning. She is going up to learn the milliner trade, and I shall try and get back early enough to sow it dragged it with the oxen, and they are quite smart. Elbert has broke them, and he has got it, them, so he can drive them any place without any rope. And I think he has done first rate, don't you? If we could get a chance to sell them after the spring work, I guess we will. Don't you think it would be best? But we won't sell them short of 65 or $70. A good pair yoke of oxen are worth 80 or $90 here. I tried to plow yesterday, but there was so much frost in the ground that I gave it up, and it was too wet anyway. Albert and I killed a hog yesterday, and dressed it off, and done the whole thing alone. We have got two barrels of old pork in the cellar, but we was out of lard, and Ma wanted us to kill one, and we had good luck with it. The cow that we bought of Tipped is a first-rate one, and we wouldn't sell her for $95. I was up to Portage last Monday, and I went and seen the man that puts pumps in drilled wells and asked him how much a pump would cost in our well, and he figured on it a while and said it would cost somewhere between 38 and $40, and they would warrant the pump not to get out of repair for a year. He seemed quite anxious to put one in. It is a great job to draw water for all our stock. I don't know as I have anything else to write about at present. James Patchen. Poor James can mail off his letter. Margaret flips it over and adds her own note to Augustus. <laughs> April 5th, 1863. My dear husband. 
We received yours of the 22nd on Thursday, and yesterday we got yours of the 26th. And we are always glad to hear from you. And when we get a letter, it is dated so far back that I always think perhaps you are sick now. Oh, Augustus, this anxious waiting is hard, and how much longer shall I have to wait? It is 18 months today since you left home to go into camp, and I can't see as there is any more prospect of the war being closed than at that time. Do you calculate if you live to stay till it closes? I should very much like to know, for it seems to me you haven't tried very much to come. You are getting to be quite a mystery to us. You act strange, we think, for you was coming home in the spring, then in the summer, and so on. Now, Augustus, I am quite anxious to know what is the reason that you can't get your pay. I thought that you was in the same company with Murray and his money got home on the 21st of March, and I heard some others came with it. Have you got into trouble or what? If you have got into trouble, I would rather that you tell me what it is than to have anyone else send home word, for I hear so many stories that well, I am kept quite uneasy. James thinks they are going to cheat you out of all your pay. The children and me work very hard to get along, and we made up our minds to try and support ourselves and save your wages. For to us, everything that comes from you is thankfully received. Now, I don't want you to deprive yourself of things that you need, but tell me what is the matter, and how you manage to get along without money, for you know I can't get along without thinking about it. I want to know about everything that you do. Think of you all the time. You never look kindly at me when I am asleep. How do you look? Are you growing old fast? How is it? The following evening, she adds more. April 6, 1863, Monday evening children are all abed and asleep. And I will try and finish this, hoping that you will come home so that I won't have to scribble to you. Oh, Augustus, I can't help urging you to come home, for I love you, and I love your children. You had ought to be with them, for time with them is precious. They are on the stir all the time, and I lack both the wisdom and patience to guide them aright. Oh, that you would come home is the constant talk here in our home. And this baby will have a great many kisses for you, and he is very sweet. But I must stop and remain your loathsome but loving wife, M. A. Patchett. Home is a loathsome place without you. What is the reason you can't come home to me, your own wife? Murfreesboro, Tennessee, April 13, 1863. Cost $8. I am now first lieutenant. E.P. Stoll was second. The health of the company is good. Two or three complain. We have had the easiest time for four weeks past that we have had since we have been in the service. But I don't know how long it will last. I'm getting quite fleshy again. <laughs> If I could only get home to be with you and the children, I think I could enjoy the comforts of life. You write as though I might come if I was a mind to. I'm sorry you have no more confidence in me than that. I, I think that if I get so I can't do duty, then the colonel will help me to get my resignation accepted, but he won't hear to it now. The health of the regiment is good now. Yeah, it's warm here now. It rained last night, but it's pleasant this morning. I have to take a look at you and the baby every day. You think he's smart, and I guess he is, for he looks smart, and well, the rest was, at least I thought so. I don't know. Uh, Captain Palmer will be appointed chaplain of our regiment. He's a nice man. He has always shown himself so since he has been joined the regiment. <clears throat> Dear boys, I hardly know what to write to you. James and er Albert, I, I suppose you are busy putting in wheat. Perhaps you will be done by the time you get this. 
It has been good weather here for some time past, and when you get done with the spring work, if you can sell the oxen for a good price, I think it would be as well to do so, for you will not need but one team in the summer, and something may happen to them. If they are a good yoke, I would not sell them unless I could get a good price. I think you will be, get a good price for your wool this season. You have not wrote whether you have sold all the wheat or not. Albert, how do you get along with, with the oxen? Do you like using them as much as you do the horses? Orlo, I want you to help Ma, for she has much to do. You must take hold and do housework all that you can. And take good care of Herbert. Be kind and pleasant to him. John, there will be a good deal for you to do. Take good care of the sheep and see how many lambs you can raise this spring. I want you to raise a lot of chickens this summer so we have a lot to kill when I get home. I want you all to be good boys. Seek an interest in the Savior. Make him your friend. and You will be prepared to do good in this world and for happiness in the next. My earnest prayer is that my boys may be useful while they live that they will try to excel all of their associates in doing good. From your affectionate father, A.E. Matchin. Now, Margaret, dear, I know you have had a hard time to get along, and I sincerely wish I was with you. I have plenty of company, but it's not such that I want all the time, although the boys are all very pleasant and kind to me. Yet there is a place in my affection, none but you and the children can fill. I hope that we shall look to the Savior for sustenance in our trials. Copeman wrote me that they had sent 11 barrels of vegetables to our regiment. <laughs> we probably never will get them. For such things, often go to the hospitals. Well, the sick soldiers need them, and such things would be acceptable to those in camp if they could get them. The sick here have received some vegetables of late. No more at present. I remain your affectionate husband, A.E. Patchen. James, you see Knowles. Ask him for three dollars for Gilbert Dowd. If he pays, you can give him a receipt for it. Dowd and I can settle up. And I want you to give Frank Cummings two dollars for me, A.E. Patchen. April 25th, 1863, 10 o'clock in the evening. We received yours of the 13th on Tuesday and was very glad to hear that you was well and to hear that you've gone up a little in pay if it will add to any of your comfort, for you are very dear to me. But, Augustus, I did not feel as I did when you said that you had a commission. I then thought you would soon be home, but I find myself very much disappointed in the calculations that I have made. Oh, it is hard to think of how many ways there is for a man to do just as he is a mind to whether his wife is willing to or not, and then to expect that wife to keep everything straight. Well, an old slave in the South can't work harder than I do, and I don't even get a look to thank me for it. You and the rest seem to think that I have no right to have any say about things, only to take care of things. Well, I don't think God made me for that. If he had, he would not have given me a heart asking for love as my heart does. Oh, Augustus, I used to think that you loved me, but I have never thought so since you enlisted, and the thought is terrible. Oh, that I had died years ago, that you could have had a wife that had not got so many faults as I have, that your home would have been pleasant enough to have kept you from going away. The thoughts of your being in another battle is dreadful. my very much loved husband from all dangers and permit you to come home. You know nothing of the dreadful anxiety of watching for news after a battle. You know that one is dearer than life is in it. But I know all. Oh, how I dread another. You will think that this is all weakness. Well, you know that I am weak as I am large, and my children wants their father. Moses is all bed and asleep. The baby has got quite a hard cold again. I 
takes cold very easy. And he is getting teeth, and he worries a good deal, so that I can't write very much. Why do you wait for our letters when you, you, when you have time to write? We have so much to do that it is very hard work to write even once a week. You have ought to write often, for you are exposed to so much that we are always so anxious about you. But I must stop and go to bed with the baby. So good night from your lonesome wife, Margaret A. Thatcher. Wyasdina, Wisconsin, April 26th. 1863. Dear Father, I will try and write a few lines to you. I have been to meeting today and have just got home and ate my supper. We got a letter from you Tuesday and was glad to hear that you was well and also that you had gone up another step. You wanted that I should see Knowles and ask him for three dollars for Dauda. I have not seen him, but he is drinking pretty hard, I guess, and I don't think he will ever pay it. Still he may, but I have my doubts about it. We lack one day of having all our wheat in. One of the oxen is lame, or we would have got it done yesterday. We will have 43 acres, and you must come home and help us cut it. I will sow about seven acres of oats and plant 12 acres of corn and about an acre and a half of potatoes. I have no news to write. I am very tired and don't expect to get rested till the corn is planted, which will be in about three weeks or more. I haven't put kit to any horse, and I've none to put. I guess I will put to Milo Phelps's horse. He has got a good one, only he is gray. James Patchen. she has been accustomed to do, Margaret adds her own letter on the back of James's side. April 26, 1863, Tuesday morning. We are all as well as usual, only that we are so tired. I have got some lime to whitewash with, but it looks like a hard job for me to undertake, for my shoulder is quite lame. But there is no other way but work for me. James has gone up to finish sowing wheat, and John has got to go for the mail, so everyone has to keep moving. Margaret. Murfreesboro, Tennessee, May 2nd, 1863. Dear wife, I have received a letter from you and Mary and James and Albert and was glad to hear that you were all well. I am well today. The letter came through in four days. Now, I don't know whether you want me at home or not. I know I want to be there, but you have you have a great deal of fault to find with me, and I'm led to think that you don't want to see me much. I have thought it my duty to do many things that you have found fault about. How would you feel if I were to write that I had died years ago so that you could have gotten someone else to make you feel happy? Now, because I do not agree with you and what I ought to do, to have you say that I've lost all respect for you, I think is not right. I will admit, though, that had I known that I should have had to be so long for my family, that it would not have been a question as to whether it were my duty or not to leave my family or not. However, I was here, and I shall try to do my duty here till I get home, which will be as soon as I can. There is a skirmish almost every day in front of our picket lines. There are more or less refugees come into the lines every day. And the reports they give of destitution and suffering is terrible. And they look as though they have seen suffering. General Rosecrans is putting through those that are not fit for military duty onto farms between here and Nashville and lets them have horses and mules that are not fit for use here to work with. And he intends that they shall raise enough of their own to use them there at least. There is a great many Negroes employed in the Army. My opinion is that the rebellion is soon to be crushed out. I hope so, at least. We have preaching here, and a fast day. <laughs> I heard two sermons that day. We have had preaching a number of days lately. 
it is quite warm today. My dear boys, I'm glad that you are doing well. I think you've got along first rate. I hope that you will all try to do your best you can. All be pleasant and kind to each other, and then home will be pleasant and you can take comfort together. Albert, I'm glad that you're improving your writing so well. Write me a long letter and tell me all the news. Orlo and John, don't you write yet? Take good care of little Herbert and be kind and pleasant to him. No more at this time. To my dear family at home, A.E. Passion. In June of 1863, Augustus Regiment moves southward, but the weather makes it almost impossible, as described in this next paragraph. June 6, came stuck in the mud four miles from Deckard Station and the, <laughs> Tennessee on the Chattanooga and Nashville Railroad. Dear wife, I will try to write a few lines to you this afternoon. I am well today. We came here on Saturday. We left Murfreesboro on the 24th, and it has rained every day but once since we started. And some of the time it rained as hard as I ever saw it. And the roads are so bad that it is hard to get the teams along, so we shall have to stay here for a few days, probably wait for the cars to go to Deckard. While his wife and family attend to the farming, Augustus and the 10th Wisconsin move into Georgia. Soldiers during the war often complained that they didn't know how long they would be encamped in any one place. This next letter, dated three days before the Battle of Chickamauga, indicates that first lieutenants weren't privy to that information either. Stevens Gap, Georgia, Wednesday, September 16th, 1863. My dear family, there's not much transpired of importance here since I wrote you last. We're still in the same place where I last wrote. We have pitched our tents and may stay a week. I am well. And there is but few sick now. There is one of our company sick, and he starts for Chattanooga in the morning. Dr. Mitchell leaves us tomorrow, and he goes to Arkansas. I believe to be a surgeon with the 25th Regiment. It is warm here, and yet the roads are very dusty. I expect the reason that we stop here is to get rations along, for we are very short on some rations now. There is quite a train gone back for rations. Whether we shall have to remain here until the railroad is repaired to Chattanooga, I can't tell. I suppose the capture of that place was the object of this campaign. But the enemy is gathering in quite a force about 20 miles from here. Some say 60,000 men. That's a rumor now. We do not get any news of late. We have had a little from Charleston. My dear boys, all of you, I regret that I'm depriving you of so many privileges by being away from you. I always took a great deal of happiness with my children and I hope I shall again. James, you have to be a young man now. As you are the oldest, there's a great deal of responsibility is upon you. The way you do will have influence upon your brothers. I know the influence that will be thrown around you. There are some that will try to make you think that they are your friends and try to make you think that father and mother are just too superstitious and that a young man must enjoy themselves. Now, there cannot be much enjoyment in vice or vicious company. Seek your pleasure among the virtuous and the good. I believe so far as I can learn that you do seek good society. No, James, be very kind to Ma. But my dear wife, I expect a letter when we get mail again. I think it will be today or tomorrow. You said you did not think the likeness I sent you looked natural. I thought it did. And you were afraid that I would not like the old looking woman that I left behind. I guess you would think different if I could get a hold of you. Give that baby a good hug and kiss for me. Goodbye for this time. My dear family, A.E. Patchen. 
Augustus' rumor of a large Confederate force in the area proved true. On September 19th, the Battle of Chickamauga begins. It is to be the most significant Union defeat in the Western Theater, and certainly the most deadly. It, the Battle of Chickamauga takes its name from a nearby creek named by the Cherokees, and it means river of death. The letters home cease coming.